This is a webinar for Fujifilm Sonosite. This is Dr. Jeffrey Gonzalez, and I'm going to be discussing the uses of ultrasound for neuraxial analgesia and anesthesia. The objectives are to discuss the utility of ultrasound for epidural and subarachnoid access, demonstrate the potential advantages of utilizing ultrasound for epidural and subarachnoid access, demonstrate optimal visualization of the posterior complex in both short axis and long axis views of the lumbar spine, and demonstrate scanning and identification techniques with ultrasound for epidural and subarachnoid access. The demonstrated uses of ultrasound for neuraxial techniques include identification of the midline and sagittal plane with or without palpable external landmarks. So for example, in someone who is pregnant and or obese. Identification of the interspinous space between two or more spinous processes. Identification of the posterior ligamentous complex, which includes the ligamentum flavum, flavum the posterior dura, and the inner and supraspinatus ligaments, as well as identification of other bony structures, which can include the sacrum, the lamina, and the transverse processes, which can be utilized for other regional techniques, such as paravertebral blocks. The first step for neuraxial scanning techniques with ultrasound will be probe choice. The best opportunity to visualize and practice this approach starts with a curvy linear probe. Probe choices for ultrasound and regional techniques generally revolve around either linear probes or curvy linear probes. The second step is to, max, is to maximize the visualization. You'd want to choose general or penetration mode while using the curvy linear probe. This can be done with the soft key selection. So a 5 to 2 megahertz curvy linear probe in the penetration or general mode will have the probe operating at somewhere between 2 to 3.5 megahertz. This is a low frequency wavelength that produces the best penetration and ultimately the best opportunity to visualize the technique for neuraxial scanning. Here you see a sagittal scan of the neuraxium posterior representing by the top of the screen here, the stick figure representing the orientation of the body, the head at cephalad, legs down by caudad. You can see this is a C60 Pro being used in the general mode for maximal optimization of these uh, landmarks here. And we'll go over the landmarks shortly and what they, meet, what they represent exactly in the next few scans. The third step in the utilization of ultrasound for neuraxial techniques is the scanning technique utilized for visualization and or approach. The transverse scan or short axis view is one type of technique. In this type of scan, the probe is laid in a horizontal plane to the midline, which is demonstrated by the white line here. This is utilized for visualization of landmarks. It can increase the accuracy for proper needle placement, not only guiding you to an interspinous space, but also giving you an idea of needle direction based upon the angle of the beam to obtain the optimal view on the scan. It is a mapping technique rather than a real-time technique, which means that it can generate optimal landmarks to help you find interspinous, interspinous spaces uh, rather than real-time needle approaches. The optimal position for the patient and the scanner in this technique is the patient in the sitting position. Another technique of scanning is the sagittal or long axis view. Here the probe can be rotated to the left or to the right to obtain a vertical scan uh, just off the midline or at the midline. It's utilized for visualization of landmarks as well. But this may also be a real-time approach uh, for needle and catheter placement. It's congruent to a paramedian approach, uh, which the midline can be obtained by tilting the probe and the beam. And for this, the optimal position for the patient is gonna be in the lateral decubitus position. If the practitioner is right-handed, it would seemingly be optimal to have the patient in the left lateral decubitus position as the probe uh, is utilized and the needle may be placed. A couple of important things when starting with either a long axis or a short axis scan at the midline approach. To start, basically if you want to identify lumbar levels, you start at the sacrum in a sagittal or long axis scan and scan cephalad. If you want to go to the transverse scan, you would then rotate 90 degrees to a transverse scan. One of the caveats of a transverse scan, which we'll show in just a few slides, is that at the spinous process, 
a transverse scan will demonstrate an acoustic shadow. And that comes from the bony process. You can see in this slide here the sacrum, our starting point to count levels, the next level being L5, the level after that being L4, that any bone will produce an acoustic shadow because of attenuation of the beam. You can see the acoustic shadow from the sacrum there. You can see the L4, L5 interspace not producing a shadow. And you can see L4 spinous process producing a shadow. So if starting at the sacrum, which appears as a flat hyperechoic bony structure, is a good place to start if you prefer to count up spaces while identifying the midline. Here's a demonstration of that transverse scan right at a spinous process. You can see the spinous process den denoted by the arrow at the top there producing shadow because of attenuation of the beam, which corresponds on the left to the model there. You can then see the lamina there also producing a shadow, and you can see that demonstrated by the next blue dot, and the articular process also producing a shadow. So if you are along that bony prominence there in the back and not in an interspinous space, you will see shadow being produced because of the attenuation of the beam from those bony landmarks. The benefit of utilizing the transverse or short axis scan with ultrasound is twofold. One, it can help us mark spinous processes. So for example, L5, L4, and that will help us demonstrate the midline, which we can is demonstrated by the yellow line here. So for each time that I scan and I have acoustic shadow right above my probe, I can make a, a mark, scan to the next spinous process, make a mark. That will help me denote some point of midline. I can also utilize my ultrasound probe to identify interspinous space. So where I have an interspinous space and no acoustic shadow, on each side of the probe, I can make a mark. And from that line, that would be my view of interspinous space. Where that crosses the midline, that would be my needle insertion site. Another benefit of scanning in the midline or short axis scan approach is that my needle and angle beam will be somewhat congruent. So as I tilt my beam cephalad or caudad to obtain the view without acoustic shadow, that gives me an idea of the angle that my needle might have to take to reach the posterior complex. Here you can see on this model here the green dots with the probe producing an acoustic shadow and marking right above the probe that I'm basically marking spinous process to spinous process. When I'm on top of a spinous process, as demonstrated on the left, you will have acoustic shadow. When you are in between spinous processes, you will have no acoustic shadow because ligament does not produce shadow. And here you can see that demonstrated as an optimal scan on the left, posterior denoted there where our beam is coming from. I'm in an inner spinous space because I have no acoustic shadow from the spinous process because I can see the posterior and anterior complexes, posterior here, anterior here. I can see the articular processes of the facets producing shadow. So as my probe is right in the red outline here, what I'm seeing is beyond the inner spinous space there into the anterior and posterior complexes. There are the facets. There is the anterior complex portion of the vertebral body. And above and below that would be the anterior complex portion of the intervertebral discs. And here you can see uh, even more demonstrated. Here you see the articular processes producing shadow as they are bony structures. Here you can see that acoustic shadow on both sides. Here you have no attenuation of the beam, so we're able to visualize most anteriorly the posterior border of the vertebral body. More posterior, we have the ligamentum flavum, the potential epidural space, the posterior dura, and the intrathecal sac. And you can see the epidural space somewhat congruent to at or just more anterior to the level of the fascicular uh, facet articular processes. As we scan more laterally or see more laterally, we may be able to see things such as the transverse process as well. Here is a short axis scan. You can see we start out with a, 
fairly optimal view. There's the anterior complex, and we're scanning Cephalad here, and we get to spinous process where we have acoustic shadow, inability to visualize anything beyond that spinous process. So in summary, the transverse scan is utilized to identify the angle that the needle might take by adjusting the, the angle of the beam to optimize the visualization of the posterior ligamentous complex. Keep in mind that bone will be hyperechoic and produce a shadow, so we can utilize the transverse scan to count spinous processes or at least obtain a midline between two spinous processes. And keep in mind that fascia, such as ligament, will be hyperechoic and not produce a shadow. So we can utilize the transverse scan to also identify an inner spinous space, uh, which would help us identify our needle insertion site and potential approach for epidural and subarachnoid access. So to continue and complete our discussion on the visualization of the neuraxial technique under ultrasound, as well as the approach, the secondary step or alternative step would be a sagittal view or a long axis scan. And here you can see the sacrum and its characteristic flatness and acoustic shadow with the next spinous process of L5 and L4, and in between both L4 and L5. And L5 and the sacrum, you have an interspinous space. You can see the anterior complex and the posterior complex here. Uh, so an in-plane needle approach is possible uh, under ultrasound guidance and the use of two hands, of course. You would position the patient in the lateral decubitus position. From the scan, you can also then rotate 90 degrees to get the transverse scan. Uh, you can identify the midline here. This approach, however, would be more uh, congruent with a paramedian approach with your needle, but also a paramedian view with your ultrasound. So just a little bit off midline, moving the angle of the beam towards back towards the midline. And as I said before, this may be possible to use as an in-plane, real-time approach uh, in lumbar uh, approaches for the neuraxial techniques. Here you can see the posterior border of the posterior complex and the posterior border of the anterior complex uh, when we talk about the inner spinous space. Now, if you were to scan laterally in either direction too far off the midline, you would eventually see transverse processes, which are bony prominences, which are going to produce a characteristic acoustic shadow as well. Uh, they are more shallow than spinous processes, so they will appear closer to the posterior side or the top of the screen as you're scanning. Uh, but if you were up in the thoracic area, the ribs are even more shallow than the transverse processes, and that is one way to differentiate ribs from transverse processes, lamina, and spinous processes. So here is a scan starting uh, at the level of L5 here. The sacrum is here. L4 is here. You can see posterior cephalad and caudad. This scan will start in the sagittal scan, turn 90 degrees to the transverse scan uh, as well. And so there's the sacrum coming into view here. You can see the characteristic shadow there. There is L5, L4. You can see the inner spinous spaces as the probe is manipulated. And then turning 90 degrees at L4, you can see the articular shadows of the facet joints and the inner spinous space with the posterior complex and the anterior complex. So in summary, the curvilinear probe is the probe of choice for scanning uh, the epidural and spinous uh, approaches. You can scan in the short axis, which is the transverse scan or horizontal scan, or in the long axis, which is the sagittal scan. The benefit of the <coughs> transverse scan is it will help you identify the midline, help you identify the interspinous space, and also help you identify the needle angle that needs to be taken. The optimal position for this scan is in the sitting position. If you want to gauge levels or count levels, you would want to start at the sacrum, which is a flat bony prominences, which produces a distinct acoustic shadow. And then the benefits of the sagittal or long axis scan is that you can identify the midline as well as the paramedian view by angling your beam back towards the midline. 
you can identify the inner spinous space, spinous processes. And this is a potential real-time needle approach uh, with the patient in the decubitus position, uh, the probe in one hand and the needle in the other. Are there any questions?